Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining Simania Mobile Clinic today. Our topic of interest will look at reflections on migrant displacement during crises. Some of the 272 billion international migrants worldwide are more vulnerable than others because of personal, social, situational, and structural factors. Their vulnerabilities may be exacerbated in crisis situations, as it is the case with COVID-19. Persons displaced internally and across borders are particularly at risk. The majority of the 25.9 million refugees and 41.3 internally displaced persons are in developing countries. With measures that were introduced by governments to flatten the curve of infections with COVID-19, the pandemic has greatly impacted mobility and migration. Travel restrictions were passed to contain the virus, including prohibiting the entry of residents from other countries, and some countries have closed their borders entirely. These mobility restrictions and concerns in terms of exposing refugees to the COVID-19 virus has forced the IOM and the UHCR to temporarily suspend refugees resettlement travels. Refugees often settle into host communities in their countries and in remote areas where residents are already struggling to obtain jobs and adequate public services. While some migrants may be healthier than their receiving community, others have health vulnerabilities which can be due to socioeconomic status, overcrowding, suboptimal environments, restriction to eligibility or access to services, including health services, as a result of their migration status or cultural linguistic barriers. The lack of or inappropriate health insurance often coupled to insufficient financial resources may negatively affect migrants and their health. Undocumented migrants can find it more difficult to access care. As outside activity needs to be registered with authorities, or they may be reluctant to enter medical facilities for fear of being reported to law enforcement authorities. Crowded living environments may also affect the implementation of preventative strategies, such as social distancing. Therefore, migrants are extremely vulnerable and this vulnerability is exacerbated during crisis situations such as COVID-19. To facilitate our talk today, we have Dr. Marivanyana Libeko. We have two esteemed speakers, one of which is Tapiwa Diamond. Tapiwa Diamond is a rooted in cosmopolitan and a transnational activist who deals with migrant issues. He focuses on political, social, and economic rights of documented, undocumented, skilled, semi-skilled, and unskilled migrants. And he works with migrant organizations and community-based organizations like the Africa Diaspora Forum and Action Center. He has done talks about immigration issues on ENCA and other platforms. Tapiwa Diamond is passionate about democracy, governance, and human rights on an African spectrum. He has a footprint both on radio and television broadcasting. He's passionate about the upliftment of disenfranchised communities. Tapiwa completed his law degree at the University of KZN. He is currently a legal consultant 
who also does forensic audit investigations on unauthorized, fruitless and wasteful expenditures in public and private sector. Further to this, he also specializes in migrant labor law, and he has also completed his studies in trade union law at WITS. He is a political, social, and economic analyst of Africa on both radio and various television stations, as mentioned below. Another esteemed speaker this evening is Bulelwa Nkosi. Bulelwa Nkosi is an international relation and diplomacy practitioner, soon to join the African Union Department of Trade and Industry as a private sector and enterprise development associate. She is driven to accelerate the African Union agenda for 2063 and the SDG goals in the African continent, particularly in sustaining peace, gender and youth inclusion and fighting the climate crisis. She is dedicated to building high performing organizations committed to social change. Thank you so much to everyone for being present here this evening. Over to you, Bulelwa. Um, thank you for having me, Dr. Kim. And um, thank you for inviting me and I'm looking, uh, I'm excited to having this conversation because it's my first time actually talking about migration and displacement, especially in a crisis looking at COVID-19, <clears throat> sorry. So when we look at the migration crisis, especially in the COVID-19 um, crisis, right, there's a number of factors that we need to think about. So we, one is human security or human insecurity. And two, mm. we're looking at a food insecurity crisis that we have already. And um, number three, we have climate shocks already that we are currently struggling to face, especially right now. In South Africa, it is cold in January, which is weird. Um, and, you know, with the migration issue, South Africa currently hosts millions of, I think, around about 4 million um, mig migrants in the country. We also have an act that actually protects migrants and displaced workers. However, with the COVID crisis, um, not a lot of focus has been um towards that particular um, theme or topic. You know, everybody in the COVID crisis, we've been like focusing on South Africans, trying to make sure that South Africans are protected. However, we have been overlooking or overshadowing um, our migrants and um, asylum seekers. So they are already insecure and they're already facing um, insecurities and they're already facing inequalities within the South African um, borders, number one because of lockdown level one that happened this time last year, I think in March last year, nobody could obviously travel. So a lot of people lost their jobs. Now think about an entire asylum seeker or a migrant trying to um, find work or even trying to actually sustain themselves via um, with the current employment that they have. So a lot of people lost their jobs within the current crisis. Mm -hmm. And with the number of funds that were already redirected to actually fight or um, hinder the COVID uh, crisis, there's a lot of issues that the government, I think, did not um, think practically about, especially with the human insecurity that we're currently facing. I get that there's an unemployment crisis that we have in the country, but we overshadowed trying to protect human rights and civil rights of migrants um, and asylum seekers within the country. But yet we try, we keep, I don't know, but we keep saying that South Africa is um, a country that looks at human rights and protects its um, citizens, even with asylum seekers. But with the COVID crisis, nothing happened of the sort. Um, I could be wrong, but looking at the ground, nothing has been located for asylum seekers and migrants to actually at least try to sustain themselves during the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. Food parcels have been dis um, dispatched in a number of regions. However, due to corruption and maladministration, 
things really did um, not happen as we would ought or wish them to happen within the country. So I think that's my my problem, and that's I think that's my discussion for this particular um, um, topic. So yeah, I think with this particular um, crisis, a lot of a lot of issues have not been addressed, especially looking at how South Africa has been open to migrants. And um, there's also another side of it, which is xenophobia. Thank God nothing happened with the xenophobic attacks last year. We don't know now, now that we've got um, the vaccine and how it will be, um, you know, launched and it would be um, distributed within um, the, the, the country. So that's another thing that we need to think about as to how the vaccine will be allocated to. Is it even going to be allocated to asylum seekers and migrants? I didn't hear the president talk about that last night. So yeah, I think today I'd really want to touch base on that and have a discussion on that with um, the speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bilalwa. Thank you. Over to you, Diamond. Okay. Sorry, my mic was muted. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, uh, good evening, and thank you, Doc. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to join and speak about issues pertaining uh, the issues that people in Africa are facing. So the particular topic that you are speaking about, the issue of migration, I think it is very critical and it is very important on the African context. Maybe for, for, for purposes of, of the introductory uh, and, and, and having a little bit of destination, migration, it just involves the movement of people uh, from place to place, uh, with intention of settling permanently or temporarily at a new geographical location. And the movement often sometimes involves long distances within one country, which would be internal migration. Uh, and also poss possibly sometimes it involves the global movement of people between country to country. And migration is often associated with better human capital at both individual and household level. And, and this is where now, in terms of the introductory purposes, in terms of the work that I've done, this is where now I become an unrooted cosmopolitan because I'm not rooted in one place, but due to the nature and the interest that I have with the African issues, it means that we are always in the movement within us as Africans on the issues of migration. So people sometimes they migrate in as individuals, sometimes as family units in large groups. And four major forms of migration, which we have, which is a, which, which, which causes in, uh, migration, sometimes it's through invasion, conquest, colonization, or emigration and immigration. And the person movement moving from their home due to forced displacement, such as through a natural disaster, we can speak of, of the flood which has been happening in Mozambique, uh, for the past few years, Mozambique and some eastern uh, highlands parts of Zimbabwe and the rest of the world, it can cause people to move. We can go back into 1994 and speak of the movement of people in, in the country of Rwanda and Burundi when the Hutus and Tutsis were fighting. It caused a lot of people to move within that region to go into Kenya, to go into uh, Rwanda, Burundi, when the Hutus and Tutsis were fighting. So those displaced Present. Sometimes they move within the country, sometimes they move and go outside of the country. And that human capital still has a critical and important aspect that it, it has in terms of the development of, 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 of another country. So now the person who is in movement, the nomad, who goes and seeks refuge in another country, when he leaves his place where they used to stay, they now go and seek political asylum. Let's say there's a conflict or they are in fear of persecution. They are then called a political asylum. They then apply for political asylum in a country. Upon it being accepted, they then acquire the legal status of becoming a refugee. And, and 
throughout history, we have known that people have moved from one place to another. And sometimes they have moved temporarily in search of food, and sometimes permanently in search of better future. If you speak of the Sadiq region where we have people coming from Zimbabwe, people coming from Malawi, people coming from Mozambique, there's political conflict involved, there's issues of disasters which is involved, and the issues of economic uh, refugees as well, economic reasons can also cater for that. Currently, we've got a serious crisis which is happening in Mozambique in the Cabo Delgado, the lost north region of Mozambique. People have been moving internally within Mozambique, going to the other greater parts of Mozambique, but it is a matter of time before they start spreading into South Africa because of the conflict which is currently happening in, in, in Mozambique. When we look at in terms of record, such human, now on an international global scale, such human mobility has been the core tenant of unprecedented economic growth for the last probably 100 years, which is critical to our global economy. And today, the records from United Nations and other, from other scholars, it says that we have almost 1 billion migrants worldwide. And of these, about 270, 272 million have crossed international borders in recent mm -hmm. uh, estimates suggesting that three-fourths of these international migrants are between the age of 20 and 64, which then goes and contributes directly to the working class community of any other country. And mm -hmm. records as well and statistics would say that while making mm -hmm. about 3.4% of the global population, migrants contribute to an estimated 10% of the global GDP. And they've been the engine of global growth for the past century. Coming closer to home, we know the impact that the migrant community is putting, has been putting into the country of South Africa. We're looking at people coming mm -hmm. from Mozambique, looking at people coming from Zimbabwe and Malawi, how they positively uh, manage to assist and uplift the economy of South Africa. Obviously, in most of the instances, it is done at the expense of, of their threat, at the expense and the exploitation of their labor. Mm -hmm. But if we look at how the migrant labor, even back into history issues where we're speaking of human slavery, they still contributed to the economies of the country. Mm -hmm. Where are we now in terms of migration? Two, three, four, five, six years back, we had in Africa, where the issue of migration had to be addressed by Africa because we saw the great movement of the people in the north of the Arab countries moving into France or ECD countries, moving mm. into France, moving into the USA, but we saw them dying in boats, we saw them dying in the sea, but the person who was responsible chairing the African Union, Dr. Nkosaza Nathamini Zuma, did not put the African mm. migration issue on the international agenda, I believe that was one opportunity that we missed in Africa to address and to redress the issue of continental migration as far as Africa is concerned. Now we have COVID-19, where we have, we have now where we say, look, there is, we have COVID-19, and this crisis has put migration and risk of integration at risk. Already we had serious issues before we had COVID-19, we're speaking, no, we need to have uh, proper migration policies in the USA, in the, in the Europe, and so forth. The little gains that were there in terms of the issues of migration has all of it been reversed by COVID-19, you know? And the migration flows, yes, they had increased over the decades. And some of that little progress now that we say, look, the rights of the migrants were improved. All of it now in the host country has now been affected. The gains have been erased by COVID-19 pandemic. And mm. the economic fallout we are seeing now, many countries are suffering out of this. And this puts the plight of the migrant, the nomad worker, the one who still is exploited in terms of the labor rights, it puts them in a more vulnerable position. And the government, they need to secure, as an example, speaking of health and safety, of all the workers in essential activities and maintaining and spending integration to help migrants to do what? To continue to contribute positively to the society and to the economy. And, and there's been literature written in about the OECD countries to say, yes, they've been trying to speak of France, the USA, Canada, 
Yes, they have been, from the onset of the pandemic, they have tried by all means to try and assist and address the plight of the migrants. But obviously we know mm. that each and every single country currently has got its own issues that it, it is grappling with. Yesterday, the good thing came out from the president when he was speaking, saying that as South Africa, yes, MTN has come in and assisted, tried Masiwa's seat on that African board. The COVID-19, uh, they're going to assist the documented, undocumented, skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled migrants, anyone who is within the republic. He says anyone who is within the republic. They are going to cater for them. They are going to give them the vaccine without looking at the person, color, nationality, and so forth, which is good. But most of these policies, putting them at the top of the African agenda, that is to do with the issues of migration and the movement of people, half the time the policy framework remains written and the implementation of it, half the time it does not see the light of the sun. So just focusing a little bit on the OECD countries, I've got a huge interest in those countries. So as a result of, of, of uh, the huge movement, the influx of migrants before COVID-19, there was a lot of visas and permits which were issued in OECD countries. But ever since the pandemic struck, they, yeah, their visas and the permits in OECD countries have reduced, it has plummeted by at least 46% in the first half of, of, of uh, 2020, in accordance to, 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 to the, the, the statistics available. So as compared to the same period in 2019, a huge influx of the migrants into that country, and also the reverse migration as well, has been affected because the majority of the people have then remained stuck in whatever place that they found themselves in. They're not able to travel back home and cater for their families. Even some of the facilities that they were using to send money back home and send for those, the elderly, the ones that they left at home. They, that movement of money, the movement of people, especially towards taking care of the vulnerable people and the communities, was greatly and deeply affected by the hard lockdown which happened in the OECD countries, which happened in the rest of the world. If we zoom it back home into South Africa, Borders were closed. The movement of people from South Africa into Zimbabwe, South Africa into Malawi, into Mozambique was also affected. And when you speak of migration, we're not only speaking about foreign nationals, we're also speaking of South Africans who are working in Botswana, who are working in Lesotho, who are working in Zimbabwe, Nigeria, the rest of the world. They also were stuck. We know the sad story of the teachers, South African teachers, African teachers in China. The movement of them coming back home was greatly affected. We saw them tears rolling down their cheeks because they had to take care of themselves in terms of the, them repatriate themselves coming back home. They had to use their own personal funds. The schools that they were working for, they did not pay for them. Chartered airplanes which were prepared for them by government, they were not even allowed to go into those places. So that's the plight as well where we say, the migrant community was affected, the movement, the free movement of people was affected. So back to the issues of statistics in the OECD countries, what impact does it have? And what does it say when we had the lockdowns at the better half of 2020? It then means that uh, in the second quarter of 2020, it was more than 72% decline in terms of the movement and entrance of people from the rest of the world. So Overall, 2020 can historically have the law flow for international migration in any part of the continent, any part of the world. And, and be it as it may now, yes, there are strong signs that mobility will return to previous levels, but this is going to take a lot of time for us to go to the previous levels where people were freely moving between countries. So labor demand has decreased. So it's going to affect the movement of people. Why and how has labor demand decreased? Because we are all working from home. Under normal circumstances, we would be having this meeting, this summit, this seminar in one place. But now we are all working from home. It means that people 
are no longer going to be able to move as they would move. People who were traveling by British Airways going to Durban are for, to, to be there at 8 o'clock. Their movement, the internal migration, internal movement has now been affected because they can work from home. Teleworking has affected now the movement of people. And many companies are even saying now, look, we didn't know that people can do so much amount of work whilst at home. So many companies are going to close. And the ones which have closed, maybe they'll just remain with fragmented uh, people who are very essential in the office. And the rest will be working at different and multiple locations and connecting using technology. So this then means that the high skilled workers are able to work remotely. So it affects the movement of people internally, internationally, and also even, even between, between the continents. But obviously, this, this is the bottom line. Migration will always to continue to play an important role in terms of economic growth, innovation, as well as in responding to the changing labor market. So in whatever we do in terms of the policy framework, we need to avoid rolling back on integration and reaffirm that migration is an integral part of our lives. Mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. these, these are some of the, some of the issues where, which, 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 which have been raised currently due to the pandemic. And mm -hmm. migrants, the majority of them, are working as frontline workers. The migrants are highly exposed to health impacts of the pandemic as a result of working in the front line during the pandemic, but also vulnerabilities which are linked to, for example, the housing condition and poverty. So currently there are studies which say that a number of countries have found an infection risk that at least that is at least twice as high as that of a native born. The majority of the migrants are not after pleasure. The majority of the migrants, if you go into places where they say in terms of accommodation, you could be find five, six, seven people in one room. In the camps mm -hmm. that we have, the hostels, the refugee camps that we have, we have a lot mm -hmm. of people stay it's like prison. You are held within a very short space, confined into, uh, restricted into small spaces, and it increases mm -hmm. the risk of the virus spreading. So going forward, migration and integration policies, right, mm -hmm. will be essential to achieve strongly and truly uh, an inclusive recovery. But the issues of refugee camps, the international community has failed to properly address those uh, in Africa and in the rest of mm -hmm. the world. Maybe one second. How much time do I have left? You've got three more minutes. All right, let me, let me just browse through. So we have seen the impact of, 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 of migration on employment in terms of the earnings of, of, of workers and that whatever they were earning before, that has changed. Mm -hmm. Every country and everyone else is currently struggling. So it's going to affect their movement because of the earnings. Internal migration has been affected. The, the lockdowns, the travel bans, the social, social distancing measures in response to a crisis have obviously been disappropriately uh, affected internal and external migrants, uh, migration of people. What do we do now mm -hmm. as government, as policymakers, in the short term? There is a dire need currently of the evacuation of the stranded migrants, the same way it happened for the Africans who were in China. There's a dire need for government to come and put heads together and evacuate the stranded migrants. There's need to grant temporary protected status to foreign nationals with expired visas. South Africa has already addressed this issue this is through the Minister of Home Affairs to say that there's a moratorium. There is, uh, people are still going to be able to apply and those with permits which have expired, they are still able to go and apply for them and they won't be held or be looked at as illegal immigrants. Health awareness campaigns and the provision of treatment to migrants that need still need to be addressed. The identification of options to serve stranded migrants, including internal and the national migrants, informal workers and those without proper documentation. That still needs to be addressed on, a, on the global scale. Supporting informal businesses that are likely to employ migrants, conditional mm -hmm. or on keeping migrants 
payroll that needs to be addressed as well. Set up grants to improve access to basic health services, education, housing, and, 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 and for host of the migrant communities, because mostly the grants have been to the local people of each and every single country, excluding the, the migrants. Extend the extension of uh, maybe case transfer programs to support internal mm. and international migrants. It also mm. needs to, to, to be done in the short term. Medium term, probably we need to revisit now for OECD countries the insurance regulations that may mm. constrain migrants from buying medical insurances for families back home, make medical insurance benefits offered by the host countries portable to original countries, expand origin, uh, origin countries' social welfare scheme to migrants to address the issues of employment spells and maybe facilitate uh, and the recognition of, of skills of migrants and refugees in host countries to help with the shortage of skills. Try also and have and, and outsource labor to those in, 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 in outlying places and areas. In the long term, maybe governments need to support safe and regular migration programs, support national strategies, probably based on a demand basis to increase the share of regular migrants in total migrant population in host countries, maybe establish a universal health program that includes migrants irrespective of the legal status and have support efforts to reduce the remittance costs of, of the migrants. But most importantly, mm. there is a need to set up uh, training arrangements to train more doctors and nurses in low and middle income countries and have a collaboration with medical schools in high income countries because there's been a shortage of, 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 of medical staff. And last but not least, there is a need to change the policy framework on an international global scale. There's a need for Africa to address the issue of migration so that at least it is protected because the borders and the boundaries that we have in Africa are based on colonial influence. The colonial master set those boundaries and it is difficult even for us as Africans to travel from one country to the other. Yet a colonial master mm -hmm. is able to travel from one country to another without having to get a visa. So those issues still needs to be addressed on the African context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diamond. We really appreciate those insights. Is there any response from Bulelwa or any key points that you'd like to point out from what Diamond's just said? Um, with regards to the free movement of people within the African continent, right? The African Union is currently working on a African passport for um, individuals within the continent. And I assume that they are actually working on migration issues containing that particular passport where individuals should be able to um, travel in country, mm -hmm. inter country within the African continent, right? But I think there's also like pushback from the international um, community where why is it that we are now trying to do this whole thing where Africans would like travel within the, the entire African continent without a visa, a passport, well, one passport that we would have within the African Union. But you do know how that will take time. It has been in the process for like, I think four years now. It's probably gonna be longer. I hope it doesn't because mm -hmm. of, you know, bureaucracy, corruption, and yeah, all of the stuff that we actually are facing within the African continent. Mm -hmm. But I think, that particular issue does um, respond to the need of Africans actually having to travel within the African continent with just one passport. I just mm. don't know how how countries are, especially with the African Free Trade Agreement that we also are signing. Right? It does also look at um, migrations as well, migration as well, migration mm. issues as well in terms of employment, etc. So I don't know if um diamond could touch base on that <laughs> all right no thank you for the for the response i i missed some of the parts but i got the gist of of, of, of what you you were saying look I'm, I'm i'm very brutal when it comes to the african 2063 agenda aspiration 
Number one, let's go into 2020. The resolution from the African 2063 agenda aspirations for Africa was to have a gun silent Africa. That was the resolution to say by 2020, we want to have a gun silent Africa. But currently, we speak of the invasion in Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, which has been going on for three years and four months. The African Union has not reacted to that, has not said mm. anything. So the African Union is not short of policy framework. The African continent is not short of policy framework. Beautifully written, we've got better, well-educated, very articulate academics who write mm. policies. But the problem that we have in Africa is the implementation. Whatever is yeah. written, whatever is put on paper, the implementation of it becomes brain surgery. We can speak of the continental, African continental free trade agreements. Yes, we celebrate about it if eventually and finally after uh, supposedly have, should have come uh, on the 1st of July 2020. Now we had it, 1st of January 2021. Yeah, we celebrate. What a good way of starting 2021. But that is a spaghetti bowel. How are we going to have the free movement of people? How are we going to trade within ourselves as Africa? When in terms of percentages, Africa, the internal trade between Africa to Africa, African countries on the continent overall is less than 15%. It's sitting at 18%. Then you have China, which is sitting at about over 30%, and the rest is USA and other countries. If you compare the internal trade of African countries within Africa, it's sitting at 18%. But if you compare it to Asia and other continents, they've got more than 50% percentages yeah. in terms of internal trade. So currently, we have serious issues in terms of trusting one another. If Zimbabwe does not have money, Zimbabwe does not go to Zambia and borrow money. Zimbabwe decides and goes to China to go and borrow money in China. It goes to USA to go and borrow money in the USA. So the lockdown, the pandemic, the hard lockdown was an opportunity for Africa to trade within itself. That was one great opportunity that we missed as Africans. We mm -hmm. hit a miss in that. We have the raw materials in Africa. We have mm -hmm. all the raw materials that we can possibly think of. The cobalt in DRC, which is used for, for, for the manufacturing of, of cell phones. We have copper in Zambia. But bear in mind, Zambia currently said is the first country to come out and say, we are unable to service our debts. We don't have money. But they have copper there. The DRC, the diamonds in the DRC, the diamonds in Zimbabwe. We failed the cocoa in Guinea. It makes me so sad because 70% of the world's cocoa is produced by four countries in the Okawas region. Cameroon, Nigeria, Ghana, and I forgot the other country. Four countries that produce 75% of the world's cocoa. But we fail to trade within ourselves and convert that cocoa into Chocolate, we speak of the Swiss chocolate. They don't have the raw material. We have the raw material here, but we are failing to utilize that. But yet, on the African free, African uh, agenda 2060 aspirations, we say we want to uplift Africa to the level where it trades and it, it fights on the same table mm. with the other continents. So the mm. movement of people, the African passport is going to be impossible to have because currently, as SADC, as a region, SADC, has failed to have a study passport. The free movement of people from Zimbabwe to Malawi is not free because you need to have a passport. They failed to ratify and to sign off the SADC passport. Now we want us to have a SADC passport and the African Union passport in ECOWAS region. They've got their own central bank in the ECOWAS region. They've got their own passports in the ECOWAS region. They move and they trade within themselves. Good example, but the rest is failing to have a ripple effect on the African continent. Okay, let me take a question from the public. So one question from Dr. Eric, who joined us last week. He's asking, how can thought leaders, politicians, and all Africans contribute to the realization of the African dream? 
Is a United States of Africa ever possible? Bulelwa, would you like to take that one? Comments from you there? Oh, I, I think you're still on mute. Let me see. Yes. Um, Hi, Bulelwa. Thank you. Sorry, um, you were still on mute. Honestly, and truthfully. Sorry, honestly and truthfully speaking, I could be biased because um, of my history within the African Union and me working for the African Union. But mm -hmm. initially, I do believe that it is possible for us to have a United States of Africa. Well, mm -hmm. it sounds wrong, but yeah. Um, however, I think it is within governments and countries to actually um unite amongst themselves and actually like uh, mr tapio was saying that we can't have so many policies and we keep um changing and keep fighting amongst one another when we have mm -hmm. a clear framework we have a clear framework within the ground you know but i think it's a mm -hmm. top-down approach that from our from us as civil society we want to unite as um africans but i feel like within the government space and within in country, where there's a problem with leadership within the country, right? Within the continent. So I think that it is possible, but um it is a it is a it, there's a problem within leadership, I think, that um it seems as if it's impossible, but I think it is possible to um have such uh, I see Mr. Tavira shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> no I really think it is possible. I really do think it's possible. I feel like we need to be optimistic about the African continent going forward as Africans, you know? We can't keep yeah. saying that it's, it's impossible, especially as a young person who is in um, governance and um, in such a position where I can influence young people as well to honestly and truthfully change um, mm. amongst themselves, you know? As if, we, if I'm changing one person, then I'm honestly and truthfully taking the continent um, forward. So mm. yeah, we shouldn't be of a, oh, I'm South African and therefore I am going to be reluctant to trade within Zimbabwe because, well, I don't believe in Zimbabwean dream. There's no such thing as a Zimbabwean dream if um, some, we were talking about um, um, Mozambique, if another individual in Mozambique is suffering because of a climate crisis or because of a human rights issue because of um, fighting the guns that the African Union, mm -hmm. like Mr. Pira said, that the African Union failed, then we shouldn't be happy. It's something that we shouldn't be mm -hmm. happy as Africans. We honestly we shouldn't be um, take a blind eye and say, we're not going to try our utmost best to unite as um, Africans. So that's where I stand. I think it is possible, especially as a young person. Thank you so much for that optimistic um, output and overview. For uh, Mr. Tapiwa, the implementation of our policies and politics beyond the immense problems that we've spoken about, what sort of benefits could we look at or what sort of strategies could we potentially come up with in terms of providing solutions so that there is easier movement of people within the continent? And this is a question from Pumza Diani. No, thank you very much for, for the question. The, the issue that we have in Africa is the issue of leadership is the issue mm. of accountability, is mm. an issue of, we don't have an African ethos. We don't have an African identity. Love him or hate him, Donald Trump said, I want to put America first. I want to realize the dream of the American people. We don't have leaders who want to put the African need, the African person at the top, who want to uplift the issues and the dire needs of our African community at the top. We don't have champions for democracy, governance, and human rights in Africa. So we depend so much on the former colonial masters in terms of how we relate with one another in Africa. If we go into the Rwanda uh, genocide, 
The reason why the Hutus and Tutsis were fighting is because the Belgians, they came in and they were identifying these people based on identity because due to the facial features of a person, they'll identify you and give you an identity document based on your looks and they'll say you are either Hutu or you are Tutsi, which then led to the conflict in the country. So the former colonial master has brought in problems for Africa. We now have inherited problems which were brought in by the former colonial master and we don't have an African solution to those problems. So we needed to come up with African solutions. The African solution is based on two principles. Principle number one, Jomo Kenyatta, if we go into Tanzania, where we say the principle of Ojama, we come into South Africa, we speak of the principle of Ubuntu, up until Africa goes back to the ethos and the spirit of Ubuntu, we will never realize our dream, vision, goals, and aspirations as Africa. What does it mean? We are based on community. We are a, 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 an, an environment. Africa, we are based in cooperative. We are based in communities. What we say, we are as a community, and it takes the community to raise a child. It takes a community to raise and uplift one another. We no longer have those ethos as mm. African people. That is why it is easy for anyone to come and, and, and destabilize us as Africans. But if we have leaders, I, I don't know where we are going to get them because when we formed the African Union in 1963, this is important, the mm. principle was to uplift Africa. Have a greater Africa come mm. 63. Mm. 1964, he went and he was toppled from, his, from, 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 from government in Ghana because he changed the constitution to become one, become a, a, a one party state and rule his, and become the president for life. We have seen mm. that trade coming in the African president who do not want to relinquish power. That then eroded the whole ethos of having an African United States of Africa. 2002, 2003, Muammar Gaddafi, mm -hmm. Tabombek, they kept and changed and transformed the organization of African Union into the African Union. But mm -hmm. whatever dreams that they had, we cannot see them coming to pass yeah. because we are not united as Africa. Thank you, Mr. Tapiwe. I'd like to bring Bulelwa in once more, and then I have a question for Dr. Libeko. So to Bulelwa, a question from Dr. Eric. He's saying here, the free trade agreement promises the movement of capital. What of the free movement of people? So what about the free movement of people? I know you've touched on it, but if you could kindly respond. Um, he said that the, the free touch is based the free, on what? The free trade agreement promises the movement of capital. What of the free movement? So what about the free movement of people? Well, initially, um, in as much as the free trade agreement looks at um, trade and um profit income businesses right it looks mm -hmm. at the movement of people as well because if we are trading within amongst ourselves or within um, the african continent it opens up doors for employment opportunities amongst these um amongst our countries amongst the african continent so mm -hmm. initially when they actually adopted or when countries signed the trade agreement, not, not all countries actually signed, so we are still in the negotiations as to how many other countries are going to sign. Um, we are hoping that this particular agreement does open doors for um, employment opportunities, especially women and children, in, I mean women and young people in the SMMP mm -hmm. space. So that does in, in itself open doors up for movement of people. However, we need to note that just because we have such an agreement, it doesn't mean that um, it's up to the African Union to, you know, to, to make it up to pass. It's literally in country, it's governments who actually need to um, take this particular um, policy and actually make it work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Bulelwa. And then Dr. Libeko, just a question here for you. 
In terms of the rollout of the vaccine, how do you see that working with undocumented um, migrants? Because there's two doses of the vaccine that actually has to be given. So how do you think the rollout of the vaccine with undocumented migrants, how would that potentially work? Or how do you see it working? Um, thank you very much, thank Dr. Mm -hmm. um, I think with regards to uh, undocumented migrants, Tapio uh, touched a bit about you know, uh, equal access to uh, such mm -hmm. vaccines, whether you're documented, skilled or unskilled, whether you're a migrant, whether you're a South African citizen. So whatever, um, you know, whatever plan they've got for a person who's sitting in the township as an unskilled person should apply to a migrant to a certain degree. So what I understand is that there is a um, an online system, which I'm not sure how effective it's going to be for you know the majority of the population where you know people book an appointment and um, then they go for a shot and so on and so on but what's going to happen is there will be some form of you know um, electronic documentation that mm. keeps record of the people that go for such vaccinations and then there will be some form of reminders for the person to go for a second dose which is you know, what I've, I've picked up from the whole vaccine mm. regimen. What I'm not entirely sure about is um, exactly, you know, the nitty gritties of uh, um, undocumented migrants and, and people mm. of that nature. So we're still at the very early stages where I think the strategies are mostly directed towards those 1 million doses, 1.25 million doses of the healthcare workers. I think the strategy has been, you know, um, stretched thus far. Anything beyond um, um, the, 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 the healthcare workers, I don't think it's very clear at this stage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I, I, I've missed anything with regards mm -hmm. to what's out there. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then just if you could kindly touch on vaccine hesitancy, do you think someone being undocumented has a role to play in terms of them actually not pitching up to be vaccinated? I think it, it's, it's got a, a direct impact uh, with regards to, you know, if, if I don't have proper documentation and the president says we're going to document you know, people that are going to get the vaccine already, it, it becomes a bit of a, a stressful situation for someone who doesn't have proper documentation to say, you know what, then obviously I'm, I will be picked up that I'm not properly documented. So yeah. I'm not quite sure how that is that, that scenario is going to be preserved with regards to, you know, how do we deal with such, you know, such situations in as much as, you know, the president has explicitly mentioned that there's going to be equal mm -hmm. access to to that, but I think vaccine hesitancy is going to be seen to a very great degree, you know, to people that are not documented, and that vaccine hesitancy is going to transcend also to you know quite a considerable number of people who um, you know have got you know questions about you know what is the component of the vaccine, mm -hmm. what is it, you know, what what has it been rigorously tested, and I think. Um, the scientific space, because of that, because of, of, of um, the length, um, the short time that the vaccine has been developed, it has really raised eyebrows with regards to, you know, the safety and the efficacy. And um, mm -hmm. I think that really is an important aspect for us to educate the people that, you know, due to transfer of knowledge and due to technology, mm -hmm. Uh, mm. The advancement of vaccine development, you know, as, as the vaccine development um, pipeline has really been reduced, uh, yeah. you know, from 15 years to a very short space of time. But it really takes a lot of education to uh, convince people about, you know, the safety of what they're about to take. So that's basically where mm. we are at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Bulewa, are there any closing remarks from yourself before we summarize? Um, in terms of the vaccine, my problem <laughs> is with currently Home Affairs is, is on, like they have a backlog of um, mm -hmm. undocumented individuals within the country. 
So how is it going to be, and especially even with the technology that we are going to be, you know, signing in online and using it going yeah. forward. But mm. we, nothing has been mentioned with rural areas within the country. Mm-hmm. Nothing has been mentioned with individuals who do not have access to technology. And nothing has been mentioned with the backlog that Home Affairs has. So my problem is with this, in as much as we keep saying it's going to be equal access to everybody, um, mm. we all, you know, it's either up to you whether you're going to take a shot or not. But again, I I sense that there's going to be a lot of inequalities within this particular vaccine dose um, shots that we are going to be taking. Mm-hmm. You know, it's also still going to be, um, it's going to have a shock again in um, opportunities, where be it employment opportunities, be it um, technological mm-hmm. opportunities, or whatever the case may be. People mm-hmm. are still going to be um, faced with, I don't know, inequalities, discrimination of the sort. I don't know if we've, if, if, if we've thought about that or if the government has, has thought about that going forward. Yeah, that's my um, two cents with the vaccine. Thank so, you so much, so, Yeah, so with regards to, um, you know, the, 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 the rest of the population. So what we, we need to be aware of with regards to vaccine rollout strategy it comes in phases. Yeah. So when it comes in phases, then the first phase is explicitly explained, you know, with regards to the first phase will be the one one million two hundred and fifty thousand healthcare workers, whether migrant or non-migrant. So these are skilled uh, workers. They will mm. get uh, the dose. And the online system and that system actually is very it's it's simple for them because they're skilled workers. So that's that's a simple part. Right, and then the next would be people of comorbidities, and uh, and the elderly. So now it becomes slightly tricky, and that's where now you need to kind of implement, you know, community vaccinations and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think the online system would be very. Um, it, it's not going to work, you know. I don't think it's going to work for 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 you know for the majority of the population. So when that time comes, I hope that the relevant authorities would give us an explicit explanation of how community rollouts, you know, community vaccinations mm-hmm. are going to happen and all that. So I think the, the, the strategy will take a different shape depending on the phase that we're in. Then when it goes to the general public, then obviously it will be a mass vaccinations, which I don't think will need any online registration. I don't know how it's going to work, but there mm-hmm. will be some form of documentation. Uh, the reason for documentation is so that people can be sent reminders because, you know, a couple of months mm-hmm. later, you need to come for the second shot for the vaccine to be effective. So obviously, mm-hmm. someone has to take initiative in reminding us that we need to mm-hmm. take, you know, the vaccine. So I think those those different phases would be rolled out differently. And uh, the e-based uh, or the electronic-based system, I mm-hmm. doubt if it's going to be something very viable for 59 million people, excluding mm-hmm. the micro. So that's that's mm. my take. That's my mm. take on that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Libeko. Final Thanks. remarks from you, Mr. Tapiwa. Thank you very much. I was burning from this side. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> when when I when we look at the issues of Guinea coefficient gap, the gap between the rich and the poor. The marginalized, the PGIs, the previously disadvantaged in our communities, they were affected more by the pandemic. Inequality has not been addressed. The issues of equality and equity have not been addressed by the constitution or by the government. That is irrespective of the policy framework being on paper. So we've already had these issues before the pandemic trying to have an equal distribution of the vaccine, never mind the reluctancy and the conspiracy theories that are there, is, is going to be a mammoth task for the government because already in terms of the basic service delivery, they have failed to distribute the books in Limpopo. But SAB, the South African breweries, 
are able to reach to each and every single corner where there is a thirsty person. Alcohol reaches every corner, but books they don't reach. You know, in the Eastern Cape, we don't have good roads. We were celebrating the uh, the motorcycles as a replacement of proper ambulances. Yet the regulated framework tells you the specifics of an ambulance. So we are still living in an imbalanced society where we still need to have a lot of things that must be done by our government to take care of its own community and have better service delivery. We must deal and out uh, and uproot the corrupt individuals in our community. That is where some of these issues are. Corrupt individuals, let them be prosecuted and we can have a better Africa, better South Africa for the betterment of everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diamond. I'd like to hand over then to Dr. Libeko to summarize for us the conversation for today. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Um I, I had one or two questions, but I think because of time would... would no, you, uh, you can go ahead, you can go ahead with the questions, not a problem. Okay, so we... We had talked about access to, to vaccines where there's been a very, I think the president, you know, reiterated the whole thing about, you know, equal access to vaccines. But what I've realized, okay, what has been transpiring apart from vaccines and all that is, um, as, as there's lots of migrants in, in this African, you know, space, um, the citizens have really shown a lot of disgruntlement with regards to, you know, people taking their jobs and, and so on and so on. So are we not, uh, you know, a little bit um, skeptical that, you know, we are going to be taking people's vaccines at this point? And how are we going to deal with the issue of stealing people's vaccines, you know, South Africans' vaccines, you know, at this point? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a question that I want to throw on the floor and, you know, for us to kind of debate a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's quite a critical one, you know, because it emphasizes some of the problems that we're having with xenophobia and some of the problems that are associated with migrants and the stigmatization thereof. So I think the best way to tackle that or solutions that could be provided would be looking at really educating people that there is sufficient vaccinations, this is how the vaccine works, and the specific rollout plan. My understanding is, or my take is, that the better we educate people and the more the information is disseminated, they are better empowered to really act in a, in a more cohesive manner. But um, that's my take. Bulelwa, anything from you in that regard? No, I think you've touched on the whole the whole education front um, perspective. Can you guys hear me? We can okay. hear you. So the education um, side of it, whereas it's not, it, it's not South Africa, it's not a vaccine for South Africans alone. This is a global pandemic. You can't mm. really identify to a, a vaccine as a South African vaccine. If every country mm. has the mandate to give um, its citizens a vaccine for the COVID-19 um, COVID um, pandemic, then nobody has a say as to this is our vaccine or our vaccine belongs to South Africans. Everybody mm -hmm. has equal access because we were all, um, we all struggled within the COVID-19 crisis. All of us struggled, more or less. Some of us struggled, um, you know, just below than others, but then in, in as much mm -hmm. as the COVID crisis as it goes, we can't really talk about it's our vaccine. It's an educational thing that South Africans need to need to have. This whole thing of it's mine, it's ours is mm. yeah, we need to we need to we need to educate our South Africans with that. Yeah. Mm. I think we might have I'm thinking, I don't know from a demo, 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 democracy perspective, we might have xenophobic attacks. I'm not sure. I think we might, especially with the elections that are coming out um, mm. in 2024. 
so if this particular vaccine is not rolled out efficiently i i don't know what's going to happen within the particular country we might see a civil war or we might just um see um xenophobic attacks again mm. Thank you so much, Bilalwa. Uh, Dr. Libeko, your second question, which I'll let um, Mr. Tapiwa take. Okay, so um, Home Affairs has, um, um, you know, given directive with regards to um, the, expir the expired visas, right? So mm -hmm. what they've uh, mentioned is that if your visa expired during lockdown, then there's been you know, continuous, continuous extensions. And I think the extension has gone to the 31st of March in 2021. So mm -hmm. you know, we, we, it's all good that you know, it's been mentioned that you know, the visas that have expired, they've been extended. But mm -hmm. is this message very clear to the banks? Is it mm -hmm. very clear to the employers? Is it very clear to the universities and the schooling system out there? The reason I'm asking is, you know, if you want to go to the bank and you're asking for credit, whether it's, you know, it's a home loan, it's a personal loan, whatever it is, the first response is, let us wait for your visa to be released and we can assist mm. you. Mm. But Home Affairs has explicitly mentioned that, mm. you know, these expired visas are valid. So now mm. is that message being disseminated? If you go and apply for a job, you know, nowadays when you look, in, on the post, they say you must have be a South African citizen or you must have a permanent residence, you must have a valid visa. When mm. we have been on lockdown for 312 days in counting oh. today, when are you going to get yourself to apply for a visa when the visa yeah. facilities have been closed? Does that mean as a skilled migrant, I cannot even access you know, job opportunities within the South African setting, right? Mm. So these are very important, you know, you know, questions that you know that mm -hmm. that I've got with regards to, you know, how do we now, you know, Ministry of Home Affairs has, explain, has, has explicitly mentioned that, but you know, all the institutions that depend on visas, do they understand the mandate? Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Doc, for the question in the explanation right uh the the issue that we have from in the issue that i picked due to my experience working with the migrant community working with africa mm -hmm. diaspora forum is that uh there is no relationship like a no direct relationship between the department of home affairs and the department of health as an example the department uh of home affairs says everyone should be treated in the country irrespective your right to health is critical uh, and it does not come it comes first before your legal status in a country but mm -hmm. the migrant communities access to the healthcare facilities have in one or two in many numerous occasions they've been asked for their documentation first before they can be treated if or upon failure of producing a valid document, they've then been asked to pay upfront the money for the health facility, health mm -hmm. system that they would want to get. So there is no cohesion between the government department. Critical issue that you also raised is the issue of banks. The bank will not give you a loan, even if you are still legal in the country, because what it looks at currently is to say, no, but your current permit is going to expire in March. But what is going to happen after March? You can either be given your permit or they can decline it. So because no one knows what is going to happen after March, that means that you get into a precarious position, you won't be able to apply for it. So that, those are some of the critical issues that some migrants are currently facing due to the nature of the pandemic due to the fact that some of these issues are not even foreseeable. And us as a people, as a government, we don't have enough policy framework to address these issues as they come. But critical issue that 
always needs to be addressed at all material times is the issue of social cohesion within our communities mm -hmm. through games, through skills transfer that has been lacking from the government. Only the Houghton local government has been able, through David Makura and the African diaspora, from they've been able to create some social activities within our communities to try and alleviate the issues of xenophobia. But yes, it, we, we still have a long way to go, and we appreciate the works which has and which have been mm -hmm. done so far. But obviously, the migrant community also comes short in terms of contribution towards the economy. In, 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 in terms of the statistics, in terms of the numbers, when I did a baseline study in Deep Slut, I then realized that when it comes to the issues of centers, when you do your community-based planning, which then become your, your ward-based planning, community-based planning, which then goes into your IDP, integrated development planning, you miss a lot of numbers in terms of the migrant community because they are not involved in the centers. It then puts the government at the back foot in terms of planning for health, planning for infrastructure and sanitation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Tapiwe. Over to you, Dr. Libeko. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tapiwa, and thank you very much, Bulela, for you know these robust discussions. And uh, we really appreciate your presence uh, today. Um, just to sum up, um, Bulela started off, um, you know. Uh, giving us, you know, three main points with regards to her talk, uh, looking at human security, food security, as well as, you know, issues around climate change. And uh, I think she raised quite a few pertinent uh, discussion points uh, where she, you know, her issues were with regards to uh, migrants, uh, are they adequately included in, you know, dissemination of food parcels during lockdown or any form of financial assistance, you know, is there measures in place, you know, to encompass, you know, migrants in that in that space? Because they themselves are also under their need for, for financial and, you know, subsistence uh, support. And then the other issue that she raised was the issue of uh, the vaccine initiative strategy, whether the strategic plan is really inclusive of the migrants and is there any form of documentation that clearly depicts how the migrants are included in, in, in the whole framework, you know, despite the fact that, you know, there's equal access as mentioned by the president. So those were the things that, um, you know, she brought to the table with regards to, you know, today's discussion. And then Tapua took us through, you know, uh, various definitions of, you know, what is the term migration mean? What is an asylum seeker and what is a refugee? And I think those were important you know, aspects for us to dissect and for people to understand for the general public. Mm -hmm. And um, so some of the things that he mentioned was, you know, just to answer uh, Bulela's question with regards to, uh, you know, vaccine, um, access to vaccines. So he reiterated that, you know, everyone is going to, is, do, is supposed to have access to vaccines, but, you know, how that's going to roll out is still something that needs to unfold. Um, and then he went on to talk about, you know, the effects of hard lockdown, whether globally or um, locally. And I think, you know, what, you know, lockdown has impacted, you know, global movement. And he actually mentioned that, you know, approximately 72% reduction in global movement uh, due to, you know, lockdown and, and its regulations. And uh, also the fact that, you know, uh, due to, um, the lockdown, people have opted to, to, to work from home. And that really, you know, tips the scale, uh, you know, towards, you know, skilled labor and, and skilled labor is on the suffering end with regards to, you know, these new initiatives or the new norm. And I think it's something that needs to be looked at, you know, at a greater detail. How do we now, you know, encompass uh, people that, you know, unskilled labor? Know, with regards to how we are moving forward and how we now want to 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 operate going forward and um this these were the important aspects that you know were were, were brought about uh, in today's discussion and i think i will just want to close off by um you know uh, responding to bulela's question uh, i think it was tapua's question and bulela responded to that uh, about and uh, having a united africa and I think um, in, in simple terms, we need to change maybe two things. Uh, the first thing that we need to change as the youth is um, our mentality. And um, 
the other thing that we need to change is the political landscape. So what I mean by political landscape is, uh, if you look at the African continent and you look at the demograph demographics of the leadership, uh, more than 90% of African leadership is people who are beyond um, retirement age. Mm. So if you are led by people beyond retirement age, why do we let people to retire? But at the same time, we let the people at the retirement age to be policy implementers and to come up with you know, change when we are living in a fourth industrial revolution or industrial world. So that's what I'm saying as the youth, we need to change two things, our mindset, which is the spirit of Ubuntu, and to be lenient and generous to one another. And secondly, we need to change the political landscape. We need to see more of Bulelwas in, in government as opposed to someone who's beyond retirement age. So those are important aspects that we need to look into with regards to changing or at achieving you know, this, this tremendous goal of United Africa. Before we do that, we are not going to win. So on that note, I think uh, thank you very much uh, for everyone uh, for coming through today. And I'll hand over to Dr. Lamont uh, for closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Libeko. Thank you to everyone who's been here and who's been present. Um, I leave you with the quote of Charlotte Mateke, which was my quote from last year. The work that we do is not for ourselves. Kill the spirit of self. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And thank you for having us. And good night and good evening. Good. Cheers. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.